All right, good afternoon. I just want to start with acknowledging the traditional people, uh, traditional owners of the lands on who on the lands on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people from Melbourne, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Zarmeen Hassan from Ozveg. And on behalf of Ozveg, I basically represent the vegetable industry on the emergency plant pest response deed which is a framework of federal and state governments and industry to manage new pest and disease incursion into the country. So serpentine leaf miner, which we are here to dis discuss today is essentially a new incursion into Australia. The webinar today, Knowledge is Key, is uh, to understand the detection of serpentine leaf miner, also known as P leaf miner or Liriomyza hudobrensis. We are lucky enough and privileged enough to be hearing from a range of speakers. So we have um, myself will give you a situation update. Maddie Quirk from Ozveg will talk about the, about the pest biology life cycle and impact. We have do Dr. Elia Pertle from Caesar, who's a research scientist and will be talking about parasitoids monitoring and surveillance. We also have international experience with us. So Dr. Billy Anand from FMC will be joining us today to give us a little bit of an insight into an overseas experience and what chemical control options may be used. And then we have Dan Papacek from Bugs for Bugs, who's an entomologist, and will be talking to us about biological control and integrated pest management. We do have enough time for question and answers at the end. So if there are, any questions that you may have, please type them in the Q&A section at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So without much further ado, we'll continue. Um, before we start, I'm just gonna run a brief poll. If you can fill that out, I'd appreciate it. So we're good to go now. I think that should cover it. Thank you for your feedback there. So Serpa and Leaf Miner, um, just as a bit of a situation update, it was reported in October, 2020 in Rossmoor, uh, New South Wales. The first detection was reported by a grower who was also a nursery and vegetable grower. The grower said that uh, while he reported it in October, 2020, he had been seeing uh, damage since Feb, 2020. And because the leaf mining damage of serpentine leaf miner is similar to the indigenous or native leaf miners, he was essentially treating it as he would his other leaf miners. And when he was unable to manage it, he then reported it to New South Wales DPI. So to date, we in New South Wales, we have 37 infected properties of which about 23 are vegetable growers, eight are nurseries, and the rest vary between flower growers uh, and roadside detections, as well as uh, detections in people's gardens. Subsequently, there were also detections seen in the Fassifern Valley in, New South, in Queensland, sorry, and there were three detections in Queensland in vegetable farms, as well as it was detected on roadside. There does continue to be some ongoing passive surveillance to understand how far that pest has spread. However, the Consultative Committee on Emergency Plant Pests, which is part of the EPPRD or the Emergency Plant Pest Response Deed, has deemed it not technically feasible to eradicate simply because of its biology, which Maddie will talk about, um, and its spread pattern. And so we are now looking at supporting industry and growers on understanding the pest and managing the pest. And this webinar is part of that series. So just a real, real brief, brief about the pest. It's about a tiny fly, 1.3 to 2.3 millimeters high, uh, long. Um, 
And it is present in pretty much all over the world. I think Australia is about the last country that has had this. So we've been quite lucky because we're able to draw from international experience. It's a polyphagous pest which can pretty much eat through a significant amount of plant species. So it's been seen, uh, recorded about 250 plant species. Um, everything from vegetables, leafy greens to a significant amount of weeds. Its dispersal is primarily human assisted through plant and soil material. And it is likely to be establishing in parts of Australia that have summer highs of about 30 to 35 degrees. And it's also known to survive in under 11 degrees. And Mary in her next talk will talk a little bit more about the biology of the pest. Um, most states have not put in any movement restrictions. So they're the only state that has put in movement restrictions to date is Western Australia. The movement restrictions are on DPERD's website. If you are looking at uh, looking for details, you'll be able to find it there. Other than that, New South Wales has a general biosecurity duty in place for its growers. However, no mo uh, movement restrictions and neither do Queensland, or South Australia or Tasmania. So this is just, um, you'll be able to find the details of the movement restrictions on the WA website. Um, we are lucky that there, that we are the last country pretty much in the world to get serpentine leaf miner. Also as part of the preparedness work over the last three years, there has been a program run out of Hort Innovation, which was known as the MT16004, which had partners including University of Melbourne, Caesar, Osveg, to understand exotic leaf miners, to understand their biology, to know what their host lists are. And as a result of that, there have been significant information packages that have been developed, both on understanding the pest as well as minor use permits for chemistry use. So there is a knowledge base that has been developed and which we are drawing on now to disseminate this information. Subsequently, um, all parties involved have done communications for the industry networks. So Osveg, uh, Green Life Industries Australia, New South Wales DPI and QDAF have all done industry engagements to spread the information on um, this incursion and also to look at um, helping and supporting growers to manage the pests. In the meanwhile, another program has also been developed with Osbed and Hort Innovation uh, to further fill any knowledge gaps that exist in research and also to disseminate and extend information on managing serpentine leaf miner. So that's it from me. I'll hand over to Maddie Quirk, who will take us through the pest biology and life cycle and the impact of serpentine leaf miner. Maddie, over to you. Thanks, Armin. So today I'll be talking about serpentine leaf miner biology, damage and impact. So serpentine leaf miner is one of three exotic Liriomyza flies from the Agrimyzidae family, and they're all well-known pests overseas. We already have vegetable leaf miner present in Australia, it was first found in the Torres Strait Islands in 2008 and first detected on the mainland in Seisha in Queensland at the tip of, at the tip of Queensland um, in 2015. So vegetable leaf miner is currently under quarantine in this region and hasn't spread further. American serpentine leaf miner is not present in Australia, but it is in a neighboring country, in neighboring countries, including Indonesia. But of course, as Zamin has noted, Serpentine leaf miner has recently been detected in various parts of Australia and is not technically feasible to eradicate. All of these flies are morphologically very similar and very tiny, meaning that they're too difficult to identify by sight and you can't tell the difference between them. So exotic leaf miners, including serpentine, have very similar life cycles. Um, they consist of an egg, larva, pupa and adult phase. It's a very short life cycle and it can occur in as little as two weeks. Um, and have many generations within a single crop. So this is especially true if the environmental conditions are favourable um, for that crop or that time of year. Um, eggs are laid by the female adult flies just beneath the surface of the leaf and they hatch about two to five days later to become larvae. 
Um, what you can see in this little GIF here is the larva, and that's the most disruptive stage of the life cycle because it tunnels through the um, top and bottom layer of the leaf, causing the characteristic leaf mining damage that we all have seen in images and um, in person. There are three larval stages that occur within the leaf, and once the third instalarva stage has developed and matured, it will exit um, the leaf and pupate, typically in the soil. Then after about uh, 7 to 14 days, the adults emerge from the pupate. So as I mentioned, the, larvae, the larval stage is the most destructive. As the serpentine leaf miner larva mines through the leaf, it creates the signature white trailing mines in the leaf. Um, it's difficult to distinguish what kind of leaf miner um, has created this damage by the, eye, by the naked eye. So molecular diagnostics are always necessary. Um, there's also other damage known as stippling, and that's caused by the adult fly poking holes in the leaf to feed and to lay eggs. So Zamin has touched on the host preferences of serpentine leaf miner, but one of the reasons that serpentine leaf miner is such a problem overseas is that it, is a, it has a significantly large host range, and these include a number of vegetables and ornamentals, as well as weeds. Um, so it feeds on over 200 species from 15 families, and some of these are listed here. Um, and they include onions, garlic, celery, beetroot and spinach, as well as solanaceous crops, cucurbits and others. Um, so as there are a number of weeds too, um, serpentine leaf miner could be found in them on the roadside and that might help facilitate the spread of the, of the leaf miner. But they also might start to have a preference for native Australian plants. So knowing this and knowing what they are, it will be key to managing this pest in Australia. Um, in terms of the expected range of serpentine leaf miner, we need to understand a bit about the biology. So stemming on from what Zarmine has said, serpentine leaf miner is a cold tolerant species, a little bit more cold tolerance than some of the other exotics, um, and it can survive below zero as a pupa. The life cycle can only be completed if the temperature is between 5 and 30 degrees. Um, they'll be pretty much killed over the 30 degree mark. Um, Caesar has developed a life cycle estimation tool. Um, the link is here, um, which um, allows the life cycle, life cycle stage duration to be calculated across regions and also seasons. Um, and they've also created a model of the potential geographic distribution of the serpentine leaf miner in Australia. So the figure here shows the aggregated yearly predicted establishment potential for serpentine leaf miner in Australia where 12 indicates 12 months of the year, um, and that's shown in purple. The modelling has been based on temperature and moisture constraints and predicted stresses such as desiccation, cold and heat stress um, across the year. So in terms of the impact, leaf miners um, can disrupt photosynthesis, stunting plant growth, causing fruit failure, or even killing the plants. Stippling may open the plant up to secondary infection. Um, and both of these activities are particularly detrimental for young plants and seedlings. Um, detection of exotics can lead to um, possible farm quarantine yield reduction and loss of marketability, um, but also costly pest management as a result of insecticide resistance, and that will be talked about a little bit later. Um, when the serpentine leaf miner came into Indonesia in the 1990s, it was reported to cause 70% yield losses in potatoes. And so I want to talk a little bit on my last slide about what's actually causing these high losses. So um, I'll start with these two photos of, the bean, of some bean plants in South America. They're actually on vegetable leaf miner, not serpentine leaf miner, but um, the idea is the same for both. So one of these plants has been treated with insecticide spray and the other hasn't. And it's actually surprisingly the infested plant um, on the right that has been um, receiving regular insecticide treatment. So the reason this is happening is that in um, our natural system, the serpentine leaf miner is held in check by the natural enemies. And these are the small little parasitoid wasps that will be talked a little bit more about in, in this presentation. Um, but these wasps are extremely sensitive to chemicals. So any inappropriate insecticide ex um, exposure that occurs, um, it hits the parasitoids really hard um, and only wipes out some of the um, serpentine leaf miner but serpentine leaf miner can be quite tolerant or have resistance and come back in high, comes back in high numbers. Um, and this is a classic example of why serpentine leaf miner is a secondary pest, where the damage isn't as significant until something changes in the system, such as chemicals being applied. 
So this scenario is associated with large losses we have seen overseas, and this is what Australia needs to avoid to ensure we manage these pests correctly. So with that, I'll pass over to Dr. Aaliyah Pertle from CESA, um, who will be discussing the importance of parasitoid wasps um, monitoring and surveillance. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. I'll just get my screen going. All right. Um, can everyone see that? All right, I'm gonna pick up right where Maddie left off on this concept that um, serpentine leaf miner is a pest that is effectively controlled in a natural situation by these little um, parasitoid wasps. Um, and I wanted to start by taking to a moment to appreciate if these wasps were big enough to see by eye really well, um, they're actually incredibly beautiful. So you can see that one on the right was taken with a really fancy microscope camera. Now this concept that serpentine leaf miner um, is controlled by parasitoid wasps, and if you mess with the parasitoid wasps, you can actually cause larger problems than you started with, um, is a really key component of um, the integrated pest management systems that have developed overseas to manage this pest. And like Zarmin mentioned, we do have the benefit of learning from decades of experience of countries who have already had these exotic leaf miner and have had to figure out what works best to manage them. Um, and what we know is that there's three main components to what works best. And the first one is that point of, we need to understand the role of these little parasitoid wasps um, and how we, how we look for those wasps and how we know they're um, active. The other two major components um, is that we need a way to be able to then monitor leaf miner activity um, because without a way to monitor, then it's impossible to apply economic thresholds aimed at reducing the timing and amount of insecticide sprays, giving those wasps uh, more of a window. And of course, the third main component is making, uh, making appropriate chemical choices, um, particularly avoiding broad spectrum insecticides. So these are the points that we'll be covering off of for the rest of the webinar today. Um, and before, before I hand over um, to hear a bit more about chemical choices, I want to give a little bit more background about these wasps and then talk about what monitoring for these pests looks like. So let's start quickly with a little bit of background on parasitoids. Um, they are tiny little wasps, only about a millimeter long. Um, you can see a real amazing diversity of colors, um, colors and shapes up there. They kill leaf miner flies by stinging and feeding on them as wasp adults, but also by the wasp adults laying eggs inside the fly larvae, which hatch and eat the, eat the flies. And so between, between these causes of mortality, they can actually um, have unassisted field mortality rates um, of as high as 80%. That actually came from some measurements we did up in the Torres Strait on a closely related leaf miner fly. And the other important thing to know about these wasps is that they are not fussy eaters. They tend to attack anything that is a leaf miner fly, which means as long as we have some native leaf miner flies already that come with their own community of parasitoid wasps, those wasps are really likely to also hop onto new exotic flies coming in. Now I want to give you a bit of background on their life cycles because it actually is quite relevant when we talk about monitoring. You can split up these wasps mostly into two groups, the first group being called the idiobionts here. And the way their life cycle works is the adult wasp lays an egg on a fly larvae. She also stings the fly larvae while she does that to paralyze it. The egg hatches immediately and it immediately starts eating that fly larvae, kills it. Later on, a adult wasp emerges from a leaf mine. The other group are called quenobionts and they're a bit different because the female wasps lay an egg inside the fly larvae, but the egg stays dormant. Um, the fly larvae continues going about its day, um, emerges from the leaf, forms a pupae with no issues. But at that point, the wasp egg turns back on um, the wasp eats the fly out from the inside of the pupae, but it means you get a wasp emerging from an otherwise healthy looking fly larvae. So it can make monitoring for these guys a bit more difficult and I'll get into that a bit more later. Then if we look at what sort of wasps are really important overseas, the, the really big players in um, exotic leaf miner management, these are the three um, names that come up quite often. This species, Hemitarsinus varicornis, is, um, a, provides a lot of um, strong control and it's a very cosmopolitan species. This one, Diglyphus isei, is actually used in mass rearing programs. Um, and this is our, um, one of our uh, most, um, most important coinobiont wasps here, this opius. 
So then what about Australia? Do we have some of our own wasps that are gonna be really useful? And to make a long story short, the answer is definitely yes. Um, and as part of a um, project that's actually been going on the last three and a half years to prepare for these pests, um, Dr. Peter Ridland at the University of Melbourne did quite a big dive into literature around what parasitoid wasps might help control exotic leaf miner if they arrived in Australia. Um, he found at least 50 different species exist in Australia that will probably provide some control over leaf miner flies. And it actually includes all three of those um, really important wasps overseas, which is fantastic news for us. And it also includes some of our own Australian specific species. And I'll, you can see all these um, beautiful wasps here. Um, we found up in the Torres Strait already attacking an exotic leaf miner fly, which Maddie mentioned, vegetable leaf miner fly that only arrived in about 2015 on the very tip of the mainland. And already, you know, we've picked up um, eight different species of wasp that hopped on. So what that means is um, we're not looking at needing to import more wasp species. We just need to protect what we have. And we really need to hit the ground running, figuring out which wasp species are now getting into serpentine leaf miner here in Australia. So let's move to the next tenant of IPM now, which is being able to monitor for the activity of leaf miner flies and their parasitoids. The most important point to start with is that when it comes to managing leaf miner and being able to monitor exotic leaf miner in a way that allows you to apply economic thresholds, um, just observing leaf mines is not enough. And that's because um, seeing leaf mines does not mean you have a population of leaf miner flies that needs managing. And that's because the leaf mines are permanent. They accumulate on a leaf. This picture here you can see is just covered in mines, but you can see a lot of them are getting kind of a brownish look, which suggests they're a bit older. So you really need to be sure that there's still flies mining around in these leaves before you would intervene. And because that's a bit of a harder thing to do, it means we have to rely on um, different tools and tricks. And of course, we're not having to invent this answer all by ourselves. This is stuff that's been tested a whole lot overseas. And there's a couple traps in particular that are um, most successfully used overseas for actually monitoring for fly activity, not just the presence of leaf mines. And that includes sticky traps, which can be really good to look for activity of adult flies, especially movement of them between paddocks. And another really popular one that works great is um, what are called pupa trays. And it's just a tray that you set beneath a bunch of leaves where you can see visible mining. And then you're literally just watching to see a pupae drop out of the leaves. Um, and if the tray fills up with pupae, you know you have an active population. If it doesn't, your population may already have been cleaned up by wasps. It may have dropped down because of um, climate changes, the weather changing, um, but it really helps you determine whether you actually need to intervene or not. Now these, um, these methods have been used overseas. They're gonna need tweaking in Australia. We're gonna need to develop our own thresholds, but this is sort of our starting point. Now, as far as parasitism, um, you can also see some signs of parasitism, which makes it possible to do some monitoring. If you remember the two different types of wasps, the idiobionts were the ones that um, develop right inside the leaf mine. And so if you pull out your hand lens, you'll actually be able to see them inside the leaf. And here, this is right here, what looks a little bit like a black fried egg. That's actually a wasp larvae having just finished eating this fly larvae. And then here is what the wasp pupae looks like, kind of like a little black grain of rice with these little black dots around it. Um, that's a really characteristic thing to look for. Those little black dots are actually towers it builds from its frass to prop the mine open so it can make a pupae. The coinobionts, however, are a lot harder to monitor for because remember I said they come from an otherwise healthy looking fly pupae. So you might be collecting fly pupae down here in your pupa tray but unless you put them all in a bag to see whether wasps or flies are emerging, it'll be hard to know if um, there is activity from a coinobiont parasitoid. And as a little optimistic note, I just wanted to point out that we have started looking for signs of parasitism already in the um, incurring populations of serpentine leaf miner in Queensland. Um, and these are just pictures down the microscope where you can see those characteristic signs of wasp pupae. So they're already attacking the new incursion population, which is not surprising, but also very exciting. Now, just in my last minute or so, I wanted to very quickly then give some pointers if you're not in an area that already has serpentine leaf miner, so you're not looking at monitoring their population, you just want to detect them early, which is important because it makes sure that we have enough time to act appropriately and not accidentally interfere with the wasp communities. 
Um, and also your reports will really help us develop even better management tools. But if you're just, just doing early detection in your area, um, you can be a bit targeted about how to do that to save some time. For early detection, you can just focus on the leaf mines. That's most effective. Um, they're persistent. They're not going anywhere. So you can, you can see them a lot easier than finding these little tiny adult flies. You can focus um, on times of year where they're most likely to be active. But to make a really long story short on this slide, we're moving into that season now. As temperatures start to reduce, we will expect serpentine leaf miner to start getting active again in New South Wales and Queensland, maybe in the next couple months or so. Um, so it's important to, to start looking soon. Um, best to focus on a high risk crop to be most efficient. And we've seen beans and celery seem to be quite preferred by the um, populations in Australia right now. And you can focus on parts of your farm that are most associated with spread pathways. And in the case of this fly, they move around by human movement primarily. So parts of your farm that are near transport routes um, the adults can also get blown around on the wind a bit, so you can also look on the upwind side of your farm and paddocks. And always take a picture if you see anything suspicious, and always take a sample as well. The reason the sample is really important for determining really quickly if we're actually looking at serpentine leaf miner or something else is because unfortunately looking at a leaf mine, you will not know if you're looking at serpentine leaf miner. There's actually a lot of native and naturalized leaf mining fly species in Australia. Um, and as an example, all these photos here of leaf mines, only that central square is a reportable exotic leaf miner. This one's vegetable leaf miner. Um, so because you won't know for sure, report anyways if you're not sure, but that sample you take lets, lets us do um, a quick DNA test um, that will you know, make, make us very sure if we're looking at um, an expansion of serpentine leaf miners range or not. So with that, I'm gonna pass over um, to um, Billy, who's going to speak about some chemical options for leaf miner. Thank you very much. Oh, nope, sorry, I have not exited yet, have I? Okay. Sorry, I was muted. Can you see my slides? Yes, Hello? we can. Yes, okay. we can, Billy. <laughs> okay. We can just go okay. into PowerPoint mode. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll take the next few uh, minutes to talk about my experience with uh, Lyra Meza Hidobrensis. And uh, because of my role in industry, what we're doing about it, at least with the two companies that I've been with. But let me say this, that um, I wanted to start with this because I know Madi and Zamir and um, Zamin, sorry, and Elia had talked about this, but I wanted to start with where I have the red box. The red box, you know, I come from a system that doesn't really go with using common names. So you hear me say Liromiza hydrobrensis, Liromiza hydrobrensis. So please equate it to the serpentine leaf miner that everybody's talking about. But in the US, um, maybe a dozen years ago or so, it started really wreaking havoc in California, the western part of the country. And taxonomists gave it a slightly different name. And now I think the consensus is that when you hear Leromiza langae, we're, we're dealing with eudobrensis. It's the same uh, organism. And it's interesting that we're talking about the fact that it's cold tolerant, but you look at the geographic distribution. They're all over the world, even in some of the hottest and humid places. So this pest is finding ways of adapting to different geographies as long as they have a host that they can feed on and where they can, they can oviposit and generate um, subs, uh, generations, sorry. So in the industry, um, 
we've had a long history of uh, leaf miner control, starting with some of the other leaf miners. So before, before um, Liramesa Hidobrensis came, there were chemistries, and, and I won't go through all of them, but we have, I have a table here that is given what the kind of mode of action is and, and the class, but you're going to see where I said product examples, which is the third column from right, some of the chemical names that you're going to identify with. And things like organophosphates, we had club, I mean, not we had, some places still have chlorpyrifos, which is an organophosphate, is broad spectrum. And therefore, even though it would do a good job on Leomaser, it also, like Maddie and, and Elia mentioned, um, will affect some of the natural balance in the ecosystem. And then you can go through um, these different classes of chemistry, quite a bit of them. But I want to say this, in the industry, I mean, different from what we had in the up to the 1960s or maybe I mean a little later, we are very conscious of the environment and we you know because of resistance development, we also need natural enemies of these pests to help make our products stay longer and and I mean complement in IPM uh, offerings for growers because if you use chemi chemicals alone, and on a pest like Liromisa hidobrensis, they will go through very quick and rapid selection and develop resistance. And because of that, you know, we will lose the tools for managing these important uh, pests, I mean, pests on imp important crops that we need to manage. So we are just as interested in IPM and the IPM of that complementality makes the chemicals, which by the way, are a very important tool in managing pests, these chemicals last longer in terms of you know, their utility. So I want to um, just go through the ones that I've highlighted in blue. And I, I selected these because they belong to different classes of chemistry. They have different physical chemical properties and even attributes that make them suitable or sometimes not as suitable like others for managing these pests. So this is the major chemistries that have been labeled for leaf miner control in different parts of the world for Liromesa hidobrensis because it's relatively new in some places. It may not have been labeled in, in specific countries. But what we did early on um, during my time in DuPont was when um, this pest was first was first identified in the US. What we wanted to see, because it was very difficult to get controls in the field, we wanted to see if the insect was susceptible to some of the chemistries we had. And indeed, it is susceptible to this particular product from, from the diamides. But you know, even though it's susceptible, sometimes it's hard to control. So a lot of what Elia and Madi talked about in terms of IPM and using uh, um, natural enemies, but also using other tools are very important to get a handle on a very serious pest like this one. So you can see from the LC50s that Liromisa hidobrensis takes a little bit higher concentration to control the pest compared to uh, Liromisa trifoliae but still it is controlled by this particular product. So what I did here was I've gone through the catalog of data we have across our industry, but specifically with uh, DuPont and FMC that I've worked in to see um, what are the chemicals that really offer the best um, you know, controls. And, and because it's tons and tons of data, thousands of data points. I've kind of highlighted it in a very 10,000 foot level with, with a stoplight chart. So the green is where we have very good controls, um, the dark green uh, and, and yellow is suppression, red is poor activity. And, and this looks very skewed because 
There are products that don't work on Leromaze, but these particular ones are tested for Leromaze control. So they all look green, but you know, in the bigger context, it's not every insecticide that will control Leromaze. That's, that's the point here. But these ones are used, but you can see that not all of them work and work well on Hudobrensis. That's the first thing I want to mention. So in that regard, we tested in the field in Indonesia. And it's interesting, we mentioned Indonesia and one of our diamides compared to imidacloprid, which is one of, one of the established products. And you can see that imidacloprid has been used for a while, but the diamides back in 2015 were still working. But for a pest like hydrobrensis, I mean, within a few years, you can actually lose that efficacy. So we're very mindful of that. This is looking at what are the other features, agronomic practices that help the compounds maintain their efficacy. So I'm not gonna go through this, but you can also see that different products actually have different attributes that may or may not help. That is the point of this, this uh, particular slide. So you can look on the, on the y-axis near the bottom, all the things that we are talking about in terms of how fast do they work? Uh, how do they fit in application methods, soil and foliar applications? For a pest like leaf miner, you need a type of action called translaminar activity. Translaminar just being between the leaf uh, layers because what is interesting about hydrobrensis is they can, when the adult oviposits, the larva can develop totally within the, the leaf lamina and still keep the epidermis, both the lower and upper epidermis and you know stay and cause damage within the leaf matrix. And if you don't have a product that can go through the epidermis to get to it, you're not gonna be able to control the damaging larva stage. So those are some of the attributes I wanted to show. And what we did was a field trial um, in California to show that where products are used, the right product is used and used in a very uh, careful and, and labeled, um, you know, within the label guidelines. What we tend to do, because the issue here is we are not just trying to kill insects, growers are interested in producing their crop. So that is the ultimate for us, how we help growers produce crop that are clean and, and have higher productivity rather than crops that may have a lot of damage that it's not gonna have um, marketable use, okay? So when one of these products called Verimac was used early in the season and, and you know it stops feeding of the pest, you can see on the left that the crop is more vigorous than the typical grower program where the crop looks good, but it's not as vigorous growing. So there will be some damage in there. I'm just going to uh, finish here with some of the key points that we want, I mean, I wanted to get across. Leomisa hydrobrensis is generally susceptible to some chemistries, but if those chemistries are not used well, you're not gonna get the controls of the pests in the field. And secondly, you're gonna have resistance develop on you. It is important to choose a product, if it's broad spectrum, and I think Elia mentioned this, you have to choose very carefully because if it's affecting uh, uh, beneficial arthropods, you are actually tipping the balance that will actually destroy the, I mean, the, the natural enemies. But then lo and behold, a few years later, your, the chemistry will not work either. So we need the natural products, I mean, natural enemies to complement the chemistry in a true IPM fashion, okay? And then when you're selecting these products, look for the non-pest control attributes like how it will help, you know, the other practices to improve crop production. And more importantly, um, and not more importantly, equally importantly, that the chemistry doesn't get burnt out and then there is resistance by the pest and we lose a tool. 
in that IBM uh, kit that will help growers. So that is what I what I wanted to bring up. I know there wasn't a lot of, a lot of time, but thank you for your attention. So I think Dan, uh, you are next, right? Zamin is Dan, right? Yes, that's Dan Papacek from Bugs. Okay. Bugs. Thank you. So Dan, you can you can take it over. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, look, just a quick introduction to Bugs for Bugs. We uh, are an Australian company, something like 40 years experience. Uh, we have recently teamed up with an international company called Biovest. Uh, we are specialists in integrated pest management and as well as fruit fly management with, as I said, 40 years experience. Um, and we produce and supply biocontrol agents as well as IPM tools, pheromones and fruit, fruit fly management tools. And we do have a strong R&D focus. Um, now a little bit, my perspective on integrated pest management perhaps, uh, just to add to what we've heard from previous speakers, but I see IPM as best practice pest management. Um, and we want to develop strategies that get the best possible quality and high yields with the minimal pesticides. I'm sure the other speakers concur with that philosophy. And so this includes, I guess, all management options. And we, we typically group these into uh, the categories of biological control, cultural control, and of course, chemical control, which, which continues to be an important part of pest management modern world. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about biocontrol um, just to just to sort of mention a few points I guess that most insects and mites do have natural enemies and that these can be extremely valuable allies if we give them a chance to work for us. Um, if we exclude them uh, that's often when we see pest population explosions. And we do know that uh, chemicals, if misused, can very often induce pest flare. And this is a direct result of disruption to biocontrol agents. So this is something we want to be very mindful of. So I'd suggest that any pest management decisions should always include at least uh, some, some thoughts about what impact it might have on the biocontrol agents that, that may be in your crop at the time or may be able to come into your crop. Uh, when we talk about biocontrol, we talk about classical augmentation and conservation. I won't even touch on the first one, um, but I will talk a little bit about the uh, second two. Augmentation. And sorry to interrupt you, but there's feedback saying that we can hardly hear you. So if you can oh. just speak closer and louder, that would be great. Sorry, is that better? Uh, yes, it seems we'd be better. Just be closer and louder, please. Thank you. All right. So can you hear me now? Okay, so augmentation biocontrol, I guess, is where we mass rear and release um, biocontrol agents. And we do this to complement or to enhance naturally occurring populations. Um, at the moment, there's about 40 species of biocontrol agents that are available in Australia. And these include predatory insects some mites, parasitoid wasps and parasitic nematodes, just, for, uh, just to mention uh, some of the groups. Um, and the other concept, I guess, within this whole biological control uh, element of our pest management program is the idea of conservation biological control. And I really, I really think this is an important concept that uh, I try to get across to grower groups as often as I can. And that is that we, we should always be trying to aim to create the right environment for our biocontrol agents to thrive or to survive and thrive. And uh, it's, you know, a lot of these natural enemies are quite, they're very, uh, they're very active, they're very effective, but they are also quite delicate. And if you put them into a hostile environment, you can't really expect them to do the best they can. Uh, so I, I would argue that biodiversity is important and um, that monocultures, which unfortunately is all too often uh, exactly what we see. And I think those, uh, you agree, those uh, images of lettuce um, that you showed earlier, Lily, a, a, a very good example of classic monoculture production that we see all too often. Um, just by way of example, that image that I've just uh, thrown up on the screen is a sort of the standard way that almonds are grown in many parts of the world, certainly in uh, some of 
some of the Australian production areas, that's what you see. And it's, uh, it's a very much a hostile environment with trees growing in it. And this is a, another photo of an almond orchard that's taken a different approach. And it's not hard to imagine that um, any beneficial wasp or uh, ladybird beetle or lacewings or whatever would be far happier in the second than in the first environment. And uh, I think, I think um, we kind of have to look at rethinking the way we grow our crops sometimes to, to, to try to get the best we can from this natural uh, benefit that we can derive from biocontrol agents if we're, going to, if we're going to harness their uh, input as best we can. A little bit about chemical control. I guess I would say that there never has and never will be the perfect poison uh, and that we should use these as a last resort. So we should explore other options first and be prepared to use chemicals when we really have to. Uh, I think we should use them sparingly, wisely, and with a clear understanding of a few important elements. One is that make sure we, we know it is what we're applying the pesticide for, because quite often mistakes are made. Uh, we need to understand the side effects, especially impact on beneficial species. We need to be thinking about residue, especially when we're dealing with vegetable crops. Uh, we also need to be thinking about drift, and we need to think very, very hard about the impact or the potential for resistance development over time. Um, I would agree with Billy that, um, that a lot of the modern pesticides are becoming um, softer, if you like, and more compatible with our biocontrol agents. And this is good news. This is a, this is a, great, uh, a great trend and it gives us greater opportunities to integrate the use of uh, both natural and augmentative biocontrol agents with, with pesticides when required. I'd also suggest that these newer products are much more expensive. They are also very prone to resistance development, and we know that um, from just recent experience already. Um, and I would argue that it's very important that we conserve these new selective chemicals because they are valuable. They cost a lot to develop, and, uh, and we don't want to we don't want to uh, lose them through misadventure and misuse. Um, so the best way to achieve this is to use them less. And that's a simple, a simple formula. Um, I guess I'd also suggest that many modern pesticides claim to have an IPM fit, but they may still be disrupted. In fact, we see some glaring examples of this. Um, and whether a pesticide is safe or not, um, you know, will depend on the circumstances, the crop and the sort of beneficials that occur in that crop, I guess. But it's, uh, don't assume just because you see IPM friendly on the label that these products are without adverse effect. So um, just to finish off, I'll just remind you that we have teamed up with uh, BioBest. Uh, it's a bio, an international biocontrol company with activity in 65 countries around the world. Uh, one of the largest uh, biocontrol producers in the world. And um, I guess from our point of view, this means that we have access to new technologies and we hope to expand our product range. Um, we, uh, we are already seeing improved efficiencies and reliability of production with our, um, our current biocontrol agents that we already produce. And we, we are now part of a wider group where we can draw experience from uh, IPM systems in other parts of the world. And I guess this is particularly irrelevant now because uh, we know that uh, the Lyrian mites and flies are, um, are sort of quite common pests in the Northern Hemisphere and BioBest already has a lot of experience with managing these. So um, I guess uh, they already mass rear uh, uh, at least two or three parasitoids for serpentine leaf mire. Um, they've already worked with uh, IPM programs uh, using augmentation by control as a part of a, a broader IPM approach. Um, so we plan to harness this knowledge and to use this to fast track the development of our own mass rearing and application methods for Australian vegetable industries. And I guess I'll just finish off by saying that we're keen to cooperate with any government or industry agencies so that we can hopefully get the best possible outcomes in the longer term for sustainable pest management for the Australian vegetable industries. And I'll finish with that. Beautiful. Thank you, Dan. If you can just disconnect your presentation, that would be great. Yep. Uh, we do have some Q&A that's come, questions that have come through, but before we run to the questions, we just have one last poll that we request of our audience. So if we can just run that poll, that would be great. Thank you.
Okay, thank you for that. We've got a few questions that have come through. So Billy, a question for you. Is Benevia available in Australia? Billy, you're on mute. You can unmute yourself. Okay, yes, I just answered it. And the answer is yes, it's, it's registered in Australia. All right, beautiful, thank you. Um, so another question is, does serpentine leaf miner attack tree fruit crops and uh, strawberries? Who is able to answer that? Maddie, are you able to answer that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so for both um, strawberries and fruiting crops, um, there are no records of um, them attacking serpentine leaf miner. Um, but serpentine leaf miner will attack the leaves on passion fruit vines. Thank you. Um, question for Ilya. What wasps have been detected in Queensland? Yeah, so I, I mentioned in my talk, we, we saw some signs of parasitism under the microscope. Um, QDAF also did some collecting and rearing to see which species those were. And um, we're still going to need to work on identifying them, but at least one of them was an easy identification. Um, if you remember the one with antlers from my talk, Hemitarsinus, one of the really important ones overseas, that one's already attacking serpentine leaf miner here in Australia. Um, so pretty great news. Great, thank you. Um, does Dan have any information on novel urine effects on beneficial insects? Dan, that would be for you. Um, on, on, on what was the game to? Does Dan have any information on novel urine effects on beneficial insects? Novel urine being the pest a pesticide? Yes. Yes, it, it is a growth regulator, one of the IGRs, benzoyurea IGR. Yeah, as a general, I'm not sure about that product, but as a general rule, the IGRs are, are minimally disruptive. Yeah. And I could check on that one to see if there's any work done overseas. Uh, to test it, but my, my, my suspicion would be minimally disruptive. Billy, can you add to that? I think Dan captured it. I'm, I'm, I haven't read anywhere that it would affect uh, beneficials, but then, you know, there are beneficials, but there are beneficials, they differ. So it may have an impact on yeah. some of them, but I'm not aware. It may not be the ones that are helpful for hydrobrensis. If, if it is going to be harmful, it's possibly to uh, some of the things like the trisopa, the, um, the lace wings, or the that's right. beetles. That's right. But the predators. It's yeah. unlikely to be harmful to the microhominopter, the uh, little parasitic wasps, which feature highly in the biocontrol of this group. Sure. So, so the answer is I don't think it'll harm the main or the most important biocontrol agents for. These fly, these fly pests. And Dan, I, th I think it's also because of the behavior of the parasitoids. They are not as exposed as predators are, but anything that is a growth regulator, even if it, it's not going to affect it directly, it may impair its efficiency in, in searching for, for the prey. All right, thank you. Um... Another one that's come through is, are there any records for native plant hosts? Um, Elia, would you like to take that? Yep, um, a bit early, I guess, to say. Um, as, as far as I've heard yet, I haven't heard of native plant hosts um, being reported from the um, incursions in New South Wales and Queensland. It is likely that we will find some native plants, um, but that will be a priority, I guess, in this coming year of getting that question answered. And, and not even just the native plants, it's going to be really important to figure out what weeds they like, even if it's an exotic weed, if it's a common weed and it's a host, then that has really big impl implications for management and slowing the spread. Um, so hopefully we'll have some better answers um, as in the next few months we start rolling out um, some more testing and more surveillance. And, and if I may add to what Ali just, Elia just said, um, you know, it is important to identify which leaf miner you're talking about because there is Leomyza brassica, which people are uh, misidentified with Hydrobrensis. But if they are different species, or, or even if it's the same species in other locations, 
Dali Romaiza brassica attacks wild uh, brassica plants. So, you know, wild broccoli or cabbage or, you know, Brussels sprouts, whatever it is. So, so yes, some of these leaf miners will attack wild relatives of crops. And all it does is adaptation. When they adapt to it, then they move on to the more, the more juicy and sumptuous uh, crops, especially in monoculture, like, like Dan was referring to. Thank you. So we are, does anyone know if QDAF or DPI or Ausveg is working on getting off-label permits for vegetables? The answer to that is there are already a couple of permits that have uh, been applied for and also uh, been approved by APVMA. A list of those available permits is, is on Ausveg's website as well as Port Innovation's website. So you should be able to get the details on the permits that have been approved. Um, so one last question is, can you distinguish indigenous leaf miners from serpentine leaf miner? Maddie, do you want to take that? Um, sure, I'm happy to. So Aaliyah alluded to this question significantly in her um, talk on that slide that showed um, all of the native or naturalized leaf miners. And so um, yeah, the answer is that there really isn't a way to distinguish the, um, between them um, purely because they, you know, the damage is so similar. Um, so I guess recommendation is if you if you do see something suspicious and you're not sure about it, um, it should be reported to the exotic plant pest hotline um, 1-800-084-881. Um, and then you can, you know, collect a sample and send that through as well. Aaliyah, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Oh, just just that the sample is um, really, really um, important and valuable because even if um, even if the mines didn't actually have any flies in them, we can still get DNA, which is which is exciting. And like there are there are some some tricks you can use to make a, a good educated guess about if it's serpentine leaf miner, but we just they're not reliable enough that we would, you know, want to say 100 percent for sure. Um, so it's always best to just report it. And um, if you got some photos and you got samples, it's a lot easier to make a, a good determination that way. All right, yes, Lisa, I mean, last I... question for you. Looking at the difference between the uh, adiobionts and the conobionts, I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> uh, it seems that the serpentine leaf miner larvae parasitized by conobionts will still mine leaves extensively before pupating and the parasite becomes active. Is that correct? Is there a way to promote one type of parasitoid over another? Oh, that's a big question. I mean, it's, it's correct. It's correct that the, um, the thing that's trickier about the coinobiont parasitoids is the larvae gets to keep, the fly larvae gets to keep mining in the leaf. Um, so the population control doesn't happen until the fly pupates. So while it does still bring populations down, um, it can be um, less, I guess, less useful, particularly in crops where even a little bit of mining can, can really knock back the value like a ornamental or leafy veg. Um, so I guess in those cases, you'd really, if, if that's gonna be a pretty um, important thing to reduce mining rather than just make sure the plants aren't being stunted, um, you'd wanna, I guess, look at what etiobionts you might have around. Um, and if there's any ways to try and promote those. And I can't give you a, 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 an easy strategy right now. I think it's gonna take a little bit more research in Australia for us to get familiar with which of those species in the two different groups end up being really common, which ones are more common in different areas, different parts of the seasons. And that's when we can kind of start looking for those gaps in areas or seasons that aren't necessarily well covered. And of course, that's where places like Bugs for Bugs can really um, come in and play an important role. So, I'm not maybe the most satisfying answer with a solution yet, but yes, it's definitely um, gonna be a concern to look at. Great, thanks Ilya. And that's all that we have time for. Just lastly, there is a significant amount of awareness uh, programs that have been undertaken by both New South Wales DPI and QDAF, as well as Ausveg, NGIA, uh, Melons, all the impacted industry. And there is a significant amount of information that is available on all our websites, as well as who to report to if you do have, um, or if you do suspect suspect uh, detection. The numbers are given on all the websites, um, specifically on New South Wales DPIs as well as QDAFs. 
So thank you everybody for your time and the panelists, thank you for the knowledge that you have given us today. Um, if there are any unanswered questions, which I don't think there are, uh, we will answer them through a follow-up email, which will also have the recorded webinar. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>